Good morning, everyone. My name is Preston, and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> and it's great to be here. I'm sorry to see it's Sunday, though, because now I know I've got to go home this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but it's great to see everybody this weekend. Uh, a lot of faces that I've seen here many times before, and new faces. It's always good to see new faces here. This is why we're here. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. It does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. But that's what hearing it is. Selective hearing. We have a, a lady here that would like to make a presentation this morning. Hey. <laughs> Keep coming back. <laughs> I, I did this last year for the first time, and I know it didn't screw it up bad enough. Because it got back and, uh, the gentleman I introduced last year, he come, he's here again this year, and, and the first thing he said to me Friday when he got here was, you sure did an awful job introducing me last year. <laughs> so it must not have been that bad. Because they called me up here again, so one day I'll learn, and y'all will one of the other. Um, it's a privilege this morning to introduce our speaker. I don't know him very well. I met him last night. I didn't know I was going to introduce him until yesterday afternoon, really. So uh, I didn't have a lot of time to talk to him and find out all of his background and everything. But he asked me what I was going to say about him. And I told him I could tell everybody that if they had been here yesterday afternoon and listened to his out on talk, they'd know who he was. So <laughs> if you missed yesterday, you don't know who he is. If you got here today, you know who Peter is. So like for you to... Thank you. Somebody within your arm reach you've not met during this weekend. Reach over and introduce yourself to that person. <laughs> My name is Peter, and I'm powerless over alcohol. Hi, family. And you are a family. And if you don't understand my use of that term, keep coming back. We're family because we share something in common, a background of suffering, pain, humiliation, degradation, self-pity, misery, but praise be to God, we celebrate the gift of recovery. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? So I'm happy to be here this morning. I'm having a gratitude attack. I uh, am so grateful. Uh, last night, Dawn and I were looking through uh, the uh, catalog that uh, Earl publishes, and we were, to our surprise, came across the fact that in 1985, Don spoke here at your second roundup, and we were not. A, we knew that at some point she'd been here, and I remember coming with her and dropping her off, coming back and getting her. So we're back here this time in force, and uh, <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here. And I want to thank the committee for asking us. I want to thank you for your hospitality and your graciousness. I want to thank the people that have pushed me in my wheelchair all over the place. I want to thank the people who have shared 
their experience, strength, and hope with us at meal times and in between. That's the secret that we that keeps us coming back to these meetings. The daughter and I have had the privilege of talking all over the Western Hemisphere. And the thing that we relish is the opportunity to sit down and hear your stories. And we've heard such marvelous stories of what this program has meant to people's lives. Incidentally, I'm also a member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon. And uh, I don't get much credit for it, but I am. <laughs> so we're all about recovery. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to carry the message. Uh, when we were asked last spring, I believe, or last winter, to come to this occasion, my health was pretty good. In the last two or three months, it's deteriorated quite a bit. And uh, had I known it was going to deteriorate this much, I probably would not have come. So I hope you'll bear with me. And uh, uh, since I have learned long ago that it's not my job to come up here and be me, my job is to come up here and be a channel to allow the higher power to flow through me. My job is to get out of the way and let the higher power flow through me to you. And what, while I'm at it, I want to add my congratulations to Lee on her 11th anniversary. What a marvelous, marvelous thing it is to be here on a Sunday morning celebrating. Sunday mornings are very special to me because Sunday mornings, as I look back on my career, uh, were usually painful times. Either I'd be waking up in my car in front of the house, too drunk to come in the house, and uh, Dawn would be in the house ashamed uh, with the new baby. Or I'd be in the army somewhere, and typically I'd be, as I once was uh, more than 50 years ago at Fort Lee, Virginia, I'd, be, I'd, get, I'd go to, to Richmond and get drunk on Saturday night, and on Sunday morning I'd wake up, and this was typical. It happened over and over again in different places, Fort Camel, Fort Bragg, Fort Benning, wherever. Uh, foreign places, I'd wake up in my khaki uniform and I would, I had this quaint custom of, of urinating in my clothes. <laughs> my nickname was Pissy Pete. <laughs> I'd, I'd wake up with my, my, you know, my, my clothes soaked, my uniform filthy, my eyes bloodshot, and, you know, I stagger down the street and in my, in my recollection is always a bright sunny Sunday morning, and here I am lurching down the street, and here come families on the Witted Church. They've got their Bibles under their arms, they got their Sunday best on, and here lurching toward them is this drunken soldier. And I can remember the look of revulsion in their eyes as they looked at me. Sometimes there'd be a little look of pity in the woman's eyes, and there'd be fear in the children's eyes. And they clutched their Bibles closer to them and look at me and I was totally humiliated and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And I just, so here it is now, many, many years later, and it's a Sunday morning in Virginia and I'm standing before you and I'm here to tell you the good news. This program works because the reason it works is because God loves you, and God loves me, and God loves each of us so extravagantly as, it's, as if there was no one else in the world other than you. Isn't it remarkable that God loves each of us that way, as if there was no one else? Uh, last Christmas, Bishop Tutu, the uh, Anglican Archbishop from South Africa, was in this country, and he, he uh, spoke at the midnight um, mass at Washington Cathedral and one of the things he said at that service was that Christmas is God's way of saying to the world I just call to say I love you you know I thought about that a little bit and it occurred to me if that's true and I believe it is that AA is God's way of saying to us I just call to say I love you we are loved people. And that's the reason that we're in recovery, because God loves us. And what's required of me 
is to take that love and turn it into action so that I become a channel so that others who need that word get it. Not just in this program, but anywhere. And we'll talk more about that later. I was so, I was so caught up uh, Friday night with John talking about his experience with the skiing, teaching the, the uh, disabled uh, kids skiing. And I remember John said that before he was able to really help those kids, he had to get where they were. He had to get become what they were. He couldn't stand above them and hand it down. He had to experience their pain and understand what it was to be in their particular circumstance. We have that gift in these programs because we meet people where, we, where they are. That's the reason we keep telling our stories over and over and over so that we don't forget our stories and so that the newcomer knows that we're meeting him or her where he or she is. Isn't that good news? This remarkable gift has been given to us. This gift of becoming channels in people's lives. Uh, last night, Joe uh, quoted a portion of the 11th step prayer, the prayer of St. Francis. Uh, you know, that prayer is so special to me. Uh, when I was a youngster growing up in the Midwest, uh, I'm 73, to give you an idea of where I am historically. Uh, and uh, in, every, in every parlor, uh, people, you only went in the parlor for funerals or marriages or something where the preacher was coming to visit or it's a very special time when you use the parlor. And in the parlor, you always had mottos on the wall. And a common motto on the wall was, uh, make me an instrument of thy peace. And I, was, I remember that very well because I thought it was such, noble, such a noble sentiment. And then many, many years later, I came to these rooms and I got into the 12 and 12 and it said, make me a channel of thy peace. And I said, obviously, hey, he's got it wrong. And <laughs> I later determined that the AA had it right. Because the translation that Bill used, make me a channel of thy peace, is exactly the precise channel. Because, you see, for me, being an instrument is being something shiny and bright, something that attracts attention, something that says, look at me, something ostentatious. But being a channel means being often invisible. When a river is at flood tide, you can't see the river. You can't see the channel. All you see is what the river is carrying. And that's why I believe Bill chose that translation. Make me a channel. You don't want to see me. I'm anonymous. What you want to see is what's flowing through me. When you leave here, you know, you may say, I don't remember that speaker's name, but the speaker said so and so and so to help me. And that's the challenge that every speaker has in this program. The challenge that every member has in this program. When you go to your little group at home, I have long since learned to be deliberate because I never know that what I'm saying may be just what someone else needed to hear because God speaks through us. I used to have a habit of going to meetings, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and if it was a step meeting, I would rehearse before I got there, you know, little clever sayings, little, little quotations that I knew would, I thought would impress you, you know, a little erudite uh, comments, and I'd go to the meeting and really dazzle them with my footwork, I thought. <laughs> now I know that that is a gross misrepresentation of what this program is all about. This is a program that requires me to give you, to get out of the way, and to experience that freedom, the freedom to be me. You know, uh, I uh, well, am also very, I find it interesting that all our Canadian friends are here today, uh, because it reminds me that uh, 150 years ago, some of my forebears who were in slavery in this country could stand it no longer. And they made it th by, through the Underground Railroad 
to Canada. And when they got to Canada, I can imagine a CNN reporter saying, uh, why did you do this? Why did you go through all this, all these trials and tribulations to make it from the American South to Canada? And I can imagine one of my forebears saying, because I wanted the freedom to be me. I wanted the freedom to be me. Okay. Another thought that crosses my mind, you've probably heard the story about Michelangelo and his, the great, incredibly beautiful work he did with David, one of his great masterpieces, the statue of the young David, which is considered one of the two greatest bits of sculpture in the world. And after he completed this work, people came to him and said, where did you get the inspiration? How did you, how did you achieve this great work? How did you do this? And he said, what I did was chip away everything that wasn't David. Everything that wasn't David. And I submit to you that this program affords us, through the 12 suggested steps, an opportunity to chip away everything that isn't you, to chip away everything that isn't me, so that what is remains is you and me. And in that, in that expression, we come close to being free. This is a program that offers us freedom. Freedom not just from alcohol. You know, if, if I thought it, that not drinking, which is a tremendous gift, not drinking, I don't, want to, I don't want to minimize that at all. Not drinking is a great, great gift. If you don't get anything else, but there's so much more here. There's so much more. There's sobriety here, too. And there's joy here. And there's forgiveness here. And there's mercy here. And there's justice here. All these things are available through these rooms. And when all these things come into play, we can live again more fully and more completely than ever. And so I, I want to, I lost track of where I started, forgive me. Um, but all these things are available to us in these rooms if we keep coming back. I uh, um, was born in the Midwest, I was born in Detroit. My father was a, an alcoholic Methodist minister. And he used to uh, uh, get drunk after Sunday night services, which was the end of his work week. And he would come home from church on Sunday night and terrorize the family. And I was the oldest kid. And he particularly uh, uh, was embittered by me because he had gotten my mother pregnant. And in those days, if you got a woman pregnant, you had to marry her. And he had to marry my mother, and he never got over his resentment. And every time he looked at me, his resentments <laughs> spewed out. And so he would knock me around. <laughs> on Sunday nights and it was it was pretty brutal he, he terrorized the whole family and all day all day Monday he would rage that was his day off then on Tuesday the good reverend would put his clothes on his collar and go back out in the street he was a good reverend and in his wake was a family in great pain and confusion my mother had her own set of emotional problems and it was not a happy place to be. And uh, I remember early on discovering that there was a way to deal with the pain, or so I thought. And I found that if I could make it to the bread box, that somehow I felt better. Somehow I felt better. And so I discovered that my first drug of choice was food. Whenever I was in stress, whenever my father would beat up on me whenever I ran into a situation I couldn't handle. I got, I used food. Back in those days, you could take a quarter and go to the day old bakery and come out with an arm load of stuff. And that's where I spent a lot of my time. So food was my first drug of choice. And I used food to deal with pain. I used food to, to, to escape reality. I used food to stop the hurting. Does that sound familiar to you? It can, is it any wonder that a few years later, when I was in the uh, junior high school uh, locker room, and somebody came in with a big jug of Muscatel wine and said, would you like a swig of this? 
Now, I remember that this kid who was so shy, so awkward, the kid that nobody wanted on their ball team because he was so, you know, he couldn't, he was not a good athlete, he was tongue-tied, he couldn't talk to girls, uh, he, he was just a, a confused, listen, I got a hit of that muscatel, and all of a sudden this kid who was so shy and confused, listen, I had drew myself up to my full height, and as that muscatel went down in my system, I became suave and debonair <laughs> and charming. All the things I ever wanted to be. Dark Gable. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I have found it. I have found it. I have found it. And uh, by this time, I had uh, begun the practice of running away from home. I had already run away from home a couple of times uh, to, pl to hip hitchhiking and hoboing and because my father would beat, beat me up and I just leave home. And finally, uh, at age 15, I graduated from high school a little ahead of myself because I was a bookworm. I also isolated. Books became another addiction of mine. I identified with Robinson Crusoe. I was on that island, you know, that island was so secure. You couldn't touch me on that island. There was no pain in another place. And so I escaped through books. And I, since I was a bookworm, I got ahead of myself in school. And in 1942, at the age of 15, I graduated from high school. World War II was really going, going full bore. And my classmates were 17 and 18. They were getting drafted or volunteering for service. And one of my friends had gone to Great Lakes. And he came home in that sailor suit. I thought that was the most gorgeous thing I'd ever seen. And so I went down to the Navy recruiting station and put my age up to 17, which was the minimum age to get in the Navy, and off I went to Great Lakes. And I served three and a half years in the Navy and as a gunner's mate and uh, was aboard two different ships that were torpedoed. And I remember in both cases floating around in the Pacific with uh, people, people screaming and and burning oil and, and flying shrapnel. 16 years old. And you know what? I didn't experience any fear. No fear whatsoever. I felt like I was a spectator. A spectator. But many years later, when I became a father myself, and my son became old enough to register for the drafts, all that came back to me. Isn't that interesting? And I think the reason that it didn't register when it, in real time was because I, I thought so little of myself. I had no, no self-worth, no self-esteem, and I didn't really care. But by the time my son registered for the draft, life had become very important to me. I don't know if that makes any sense. That's the way I constructed it. Anyhow, uh, I completed the war, came home, and in 18 months, I had a career at, the university, at Wayne State University. I didn't make it because of booze. Uh, I got a job in the automobile plant, and I was a chief shop steward for the union, uh, United Auto Workers, and I absconded with the union dues. The union workers were looking for me to, you know, to let me know they were unhappy. <laughs> and uh, my mother had uh, kicked me out for urinating out of the window. And uh, when she had guests at, on the lawn, <laughs> and I was 20 years old. I was 20 years old, and I thought my life was over. I did the only thing that you do in a situation like that. You get drunk, right? So I got drunk. When I came to myself, I was sitting alongside a railroad track in Detroit and uh, started thinking about the Navy. And the Navy wasn't that bad, you know. And I said, I ought to go back to the Navy and get my life together. So I went down to the Navy, and the Navy said, we'll take you back but it'll, it'll be 30 days before we find a place for you. Well, I couldn't wait 30 days because the union members were looking for me. And those guys did not play. They took your arm or your leg and put it across a curb and jumped on it. That was to let you know they were annoyed. So right across the hall was an army recruiting station. And I struck up a conversation with the army recruiter. He said, listen, if you join the army, 
we'll give you the equivalent rank, staff sergeant, and we'll have you on a train to Fort Dix, New Jersey tonight. So I played hard to get for a couple minutes. And, and off I went to, to Fort Dix. And for on a two-year enlistment, I ended up staying 10 years. And during the course of that 10 years, my alcoholism really got into high gear. I just want to touch on a couple of things to give you, in a general way, what my experience was, so you get, you get the full flavor. Number one, I was so needy for approval. I needed approval so desperately, so desperately. I had an older guy, that John T. Warren, from Montgomery, Alabama. He was older, and I thought he was really a cool guy. And I wanted to be like him, and I wanted him to like me. And uh, so he and I had just got shipped to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And we were what they call straight legs. In other words, we were not paratroopers. And we were sitting in this joint in Fayetteville with a couple of the local bells when uh, things are going nicely, we thought. When uh, the door opened in walked two big, handsome paratroopers. You know, they got their foragares on, you know, and their parachute wings, and they got these shiny boots. You know, they, and they make more money because they jump out of airplanes. So these local bells deserted us. So. I was in a condition where it didn't make any difference. But John was outraged, and he said, listen, if we're going to stay here, we've got to join the paratroopers. Well, I have no need to jump out of airplanes. But, so, but I am a people pleaser too, right? And I figure by tomorrow morning, John will forget this, this madness. So I said, okay, John, sure, we'll join tomorrow. Plus, I was doing personnel work. I knew the regulations inside out. One of the things was, in order to be a paratrooper, you had to take a more rigorous physical. And one of the things they would not accept was flat feet. And I have flat feet. So the next morning, John remembers though, let's go get the physical. Oh, hell. So, so it's okay with me because I know they're gonna, you know, want to get the physical and be all right, right? So we go get the physical and the doctor gets about as close to me as that wall. And he says, you pass, you're a fine physical specimen. <laughs> I said, what about my feet? And he said, there's nothing wrong with your feet. So the next thing I know, I'm down at Fort Benning going to jump school. <laughs> I never made a jump that I wasn't full of booze. And when I made that graduation jump, 600 feet, I was full of booze. And I remember landing, and people were rushing up to the graduates to congratulate them. And up to congratulate me was my friend John T. Warren, who had flunked the physical. <laughs> it's not easy being an alcoholic, you know? It's not, not easy. So I went to Fort Bragg, 503rd uh, Infantry, and uh, 3rd Battalion, 503rd. And uh, I made seven jumps. And on the seventh jump, I broke my collarbone. And I cheered. I cheered. Because jumping out of airplanes was not my way of making a living. Uh, during my Army experience, though, I was, I, was a kind of, I was a parade ground soldier. I was excellent at making first impressions. You know, I was the kind of guy that would show up at, a, at, a, at an organization in tailor-made uniforms, you know, and my military bearing was good. I was erect. I just looked like a soldier. I looked like a soldier. My reputation was bad. <clears throat> they would know, hey, listen, we got this guy, Peter Crawford, coming in. Understand he's a drunk. Understand, you know, he gets in trouble every payday. But I would show up, and I'd be, you know, in full... You know, I would be, have such a commanding presence, and I was so crisp, and I knew what I was doing professionally. And they would say, they'd begin to trust me and say, this guy's not bad at all. I'm not, and I, I would take over the officer's duties, and, uh, and then payday would come. Payday would come, and I'd go downtown, and I'd get drunk, 
And they say, oh, that's the reason. And I was in this one organization a long time, and I, I co-opted the commanding officer. I was doing all of, his, all of his records and reports so he could play golf. And so rather than put me in jail, as he should have, you know, he, he, now I had, you know, cunningly figured this out. If I make this guy dependent on me, he's going to spare me, you know, when I should be getting in trouble. If I'd been a guy out in the rear ranks, I'd have been in deep trouble. So I had the guy where he was depending on me. But one time, I, uh, the 1st of March, 1950, was my 23rd birthday. And uh, I'm back at Fort, Fort Benning now at the infantry school. And uh, I uh, went out to celebrate Soldiers Payday and my birthday and uh, got drunk. In fact, I got drunk a couple of times. The MPs took me back to camp and I came back to town. <laughs> Anyhow, finally after several days, I got back to camp. And the commanding officer who had been very good to me in the past, there was something different in his demeanor. And he called me and he says, Peter, he says, you know, I've given you breaks in the past. He said, but I can't give you any more breaks because I'm, the word's getting around that I'm showing you favoritism. And I can't stand that. And right away, my heart sank. But he said, you know, I've heard of an organization downtown in Columbus called Alcoholics Anonymous. And they cure people like you because I think you're an alcoholic. Well, I heard of AA. I had read Jack Alexander's article in the Saturday Evening Post. I had, uh, uh, he'd sit in the bar and make jokes about belonging to alcoholic unanimous. <laughs> and uh, I uh, had no need to go to AA, but I'm in trouble, right? So right away I went to my people pleasing number. Just so, sir, thank you so much. I've always wanted to go to AA. Sir, uh, thank you. For... Now, this 1950, I'm in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, the people down there had seen a lot of black drunks. But they'd never seen a black alcoholic. So I showed up at the AA group down there. And when I walked in, they immediately had to have a group, group conscience. <laughs> <laughs> so they were all back in the corner. And, and uh, I could see the elder statesmen in the group, you know. And, I see one guy thumbing through the big book. See, they just covered any place. I made that up. <laughs> and uh, finally, the, the elder statesman came to me and said, uh, "You know, we can't uh, we can't allow any race mixing here, and uh, you can't stay here." Which is just what I wanted to hear. I didn't want to be with these yo-yos anyhow. I was thought I was better than they were. And I could go back to camp and tell my commanding officer, well, I went to AA and they wouldn't have me. And I was standing for the door and he said, wait a minute. He says, we can't let you in, but on the other hand, we can't keep you out. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> so what it meant was they put a chair in the doorway. <laughs> so I was half in the meeting and half out of the meeting. This is March 1950, and this is the way I went to AA for three months. And this is a humiliating way to treat a human being. It's humiliating. And the only reason I tolerated it was because I knew that I'd get in serious trouble back at camp if I didn't go to AA. So I went to AA and I listened. I listened primarily so that when I went to my commanding officer, I could impress him with how much I was learning. So I go back in the camp, and, and he called me in and say, "Peter, how's how, you getting? How's your AA going?" And I'd say, "Rarely have we seen a person fail." <laughs> and he said, "Boy, you're getting cured. I can tell." <laughs> so I went to AA, you know, these these people, and uh, these are interesting people. First of all, they had this thing. They sit around, and uh, here's a guy over here, you know, named Charlie, whose uh, pickup truck is just gotten repossessed and his wife's running around on him and he doesn't have a job and he's at the AA meeting saying my name is Charlie and I'm a grateful alcoholic <laughs> and there's a woman over here saying uh, my name is Susie 
I'm a grateful alcoholic, and I knew that she had a severely retarded child. I knew that her husband beat up on her all the time. I knew that she uh, was on, that had no source of income. I knew that she was in deep trouble all the way around, and here she is saying she's a grateful alcoholic. I mean, clearly there's something wrong with these people, right? <laughs> then the other thing that I found very distressing was the people couldn't remember anything. Every meeting they say the same things over and over again. <laughs> Easy does it, don't take the first drink one day at a time, keep coming back. What, can't they remember anything? <laughs> and they, people are all old. I was 23 and there was nobody in the group. The next person in age was in his mid 40s. And I figured these people, have, you know, they got one foot in the grave, now they're trying to shave up so they can go to heaven. <laughs> So finally, on uh, the 25th of June, 1950, the Korean War broke out. And when the Korean War broke out, my commanding officer got his orders to go to Korea. And I stopped going to AA. I was sprung from AA. I ended up going to Korea myself later on and getting all banged up. But that was the end of my AA career in, in June, 1950. And they, as they say, they cheerfully reflected my misery. And I went back to my drinking, and uh, I went to Korea, got banged up, came back to the States for a while. Then I went to Germany, and Germany was a good place to be in the early 50s because booze was plentiful. And you know, and they, you could get, some of you who may have been in the military, you know, you could get a case of Canadian club, you know, for about 12 bucks. And you, so you had to keep a case in your locker at those prices, right? You had to. You could go to the German gas house and, and the, the dollars worth of Deutschmarks and, and, and get a steak and all the booze you could drink. I mean, you had to drink, right? And, uh, and so I did. And, uh, and my condition got worse and worse and worse. Worse and worse. And I don't want to omit the fact that uh, sometimes I tend to do this that in all these instances, from the beginning, I was in deep, deep pain. You hear me? I hurt inside. I hurt inside. I was a walking sore, a walking open sore. Feelings of insecurity, inferiority, feelings that, uh, of abandonment, Feelings of rejection, feelings of confusion, I was in pain. And as time marched on, I got to the point I could not open, open mail because of the sense of foreboding. There had to be bad news in the letter. I cut off communication with my family. I was in bad shape and getting worse. And all I did was get drunk and wet myself and get drunk and wet myself. They get drunk and wet myself. And they kept yanking stripes off my arm. And I still continue to do the same old, same old. And I remember one day, uh, I, had, I had an office job. I worked at the Seventh Corps headquarters in Stuttgart, Germany. And a uh, uh, good job. And uh, one day, one morning I woke up, I'd been drunk. And it dawned on me I hadn't been to work the day before. And so I lay there trying to think of a good lie to, 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 to tell, to explain why I hadn't been to work the day before. And I finally cooked up something. And, but before I went in to, to see my commanding officer, I got the murine out and cleaned up my eyes a little bit. I got the, uh, uh, the uh, chlorophyll chewing gum out, which is just, was just on the market, used some of that. I got the sensen out, remember sensen? I got the sensen out, cleaned up my breath. I got the Tide laundry soap out to shower with because I figured the Tide would get down in my pores and get all that stuff out. And then I got my best uniform on and got ready to see my commanding officer and I got to the door. Then I thought, I better, I better take a drink to kind of you know, steady my nerves. <laughs> Anyhow, I went to see my commanding officer and I laid this lie on him. And he sat there looking at me and he said, but you were here yesterday. <laughs> and 
and he handed me a memo I'd written the day before. Oh. It wasn't long after that they called me in and they said, Peter, uh, your military service was interfering with the drinking. <laughs> and we're going to put an end to that. And I went back to Detroit, where I left 10 years earlier. And I wasn't there very long until I was in my mother's house behind a platter of food when the most beautiful young woman I'd ever seen in my life walked in. She was so lovely. She was so lovely, and she was so clean cut, and so that's his presence. And she talked about herself be, being a fox. She wasn't a fox to me. She, because she was just so gentle and angelic and clean and wholesome. And I fell in love with the idea of being in love. We talked about that, remember? I thought I was in love, but what I was, I was in love with the idea of being in love. In other words, I was saying, you know, if I ever was going to be in love, I'd want to be in love with somebody like Dawn. You see, I didn't love myself. I didn't love myself. I, and if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. It's sick to think you can love somebody else when you don't love yourself. But anyhow, that didn't stop me from wooing her. And five months later, we got married. And uh, shortly thereafter, we were married about a month when she told me she was pregnant. And this was a great shock to me. Because I here I was, I was not ready to be a husband, and now I'm being told I'm going to be a father. And so that pregnancy was very difficult for me. <laughs> I had morning sickness every morning. <laughs> and finally one day she said, it's time to go to the, to the hospital, and I took her to the hospital, and she said, go call the relatives. And uh, so I went down to use the telephone to call the relatives. And uh, the phones were all tied up. So I went to the bar down the street to call the relatives. And uh, about five days later, I went back to the hospital. I remembered I had a wife and a daughter in the hospital. I went down there, and there was Dawn with our beautiful daughter. And through the grace of God, she didn't throw me out. Through the grace of God. And we went home, and for the first time, I took an inventory. I decided that maybe I did have a problem and that I was going to solve this problem. And I took a solemn oath that I would never take another drink. And I went around the house and I poured out all the booze. And then I showed Dawn I was a changed man. Uh, I was around there. I was getting up at night feeding the baby. And we, did, we were so poor we couldn't afford a diaper service and Pampers hadn't been invented yet. So I was washing diapers, showing her that I was a changed man, you know. And this went on for three weeks. And on the 19th of December, 1956, I went down to the mailbox. I'd gone back to college by this time under the GI Bill. And there was a government check in the mailbox. And I said, hey, now I can catch up on these bills. But something else said, hey, it's the 19th of December, and Christmas is next week. So I won't tell Dawn I've got this check. What I'll do is go downtown and give Dawn and the baby the biggest Christmas they ever had. And so I went downtown with that check. And it started to rain. And I went to a bar. And three days later, I came home through the snowflakes. My pants wet. And my pockets empty. And uh, Christmas carols playing. And I went back to that little apartment where there was Dawn with this little three-week-old baby and not much food. And all of a sudden, I remembered this place where I'd been six years before, down in Georgia. And I remember thinking, you know, I can't stand that. I can't stand to go through that being treated the way they treated me. But then I said, what's the alternative? So I picked up that telephone, and I called AA. And it seemed like just a matter of minutes, there were two guys on my doorstep. And they came in, and they, and they brought me the good news. They said, it doesn't have to be this way anymore. 
one of the guys that became my sponsor, his name was Carl. And so they sat and talked to me for a long time, and I got a little hope. And then they said, you want to go to a meeting tonight? And I said, well, I can't go to a meeting because the only pair of pants I had was standing up, literally, <laughs> in the corner. And I remember what Carl said. He said, if you want to be sober more than you want to be drunk, you climb in those bridges and you come with me. And so I climbed in those bridges and went with Carl to the old 12-step group on West Michigan, West Grand Boulevard in the shadow of the Ambassador Bridge in Detroit. And it was a cold, cold night and the car was warm and the meat warm in the meeting. You can imagine what I must have smelled like when I walked in. But you know what? A most amazing thing happened. I walked in that meeting and people embraced me. And they said, welcome. And they said, we've been waiting for you. They said, we've got a place for you. They said, you belong here. They said, you, you're one of us. They said, if you want to get well, you'll come in and join up with us. And so I went in that room. And you know what? My life has never been the same. Do you hear me? My life has never been the same. And so I tell you that for me it's either AA or Amen. A while ago I talked about uh, Bill Wilson and uh, talked about uh, being a channel. That's such an important concept to me. This notion of being a channel, of being somebody that God can use. You know, I used to think early on that I got sober so that I could get a big job, important job, which is wonderful if you can do that, but it's not the reason I'm sober. And I thought, well, maybe I got this, got sober so I can get a Mercedes 500 or a, or a sports car or something, you know. And that's okay, that's wonderful. But not the reason I'm sober. Maybe I, I'm sober because I can get a gorgeous wife or a partner or whatever. But that's not the reason. The reason that God has given me and you this precious gift is so that we can be channels, so that God can use us in service, so we can help those kids in the ski program, so we can be of service wherever we are. You know, this idea of service has several ramifications. You know, we talk about service very loosely. If I go to a meeting tonight, that's giving service. It's, it is true. People have to go to meetings and give service. Uh, if I picking up the making the coffee in service, but being but service is also practicing these principles in all my affairs. If I'm practicing these principles in all my affairs, it means I cannot walk past anybody in trouble without extending my hand. What's the thing? If anybody anywhere. What's it, what is it? Reaches out for help. Let the hand of AA be there. Now, it doesn't mean I walk up with my AA Superman suit on, but it means that in my own identity, in my own identity, I reach out and make myself responsive and responsible to whoever needs my help. It says in, in the big book, page 164, to keep it, you've got to give it away. But you can't give away what you haven't got. To keep it, you got to give it away, but you can't give away what you haven't got. And so my challenge every day is to, to, is to have something to give away. Uh, the great prophet of the 20th century once talked about uh, the need to keep the bread fresh. Keep the bread fresh. That's another metaphor for what we get in these rooms. Think of it as bread. I like the, the old thing about, you know, what we have, one beggar tells another beggar where he found the bread. That's what Bill Wilson did to Dr. Bob. He, he went to Dr. Bob 
another beggar and told him where he found the bread. That's part of our job, to, to, to take that bread. But we've got to keep it fresh. We've got to keep it fresh. We have, and we have to keep it, we keep it fresh by working this program and letting the program permeate our being. The program is not something we participate in. The program is something that we try to live. The program is something that we let become a part of us so that we inhale it and exhale it so that it, it comes out of our pores, so that it is so deeply embedded into our consciousness that every action we take as best we can, whether we fail or succeed, is based on these principles. A very wise woman once said, God does not require us to be successful. God only requires us to be faithful. And that's what this program asks me to do every day. Not to be successful, but to be faithful. To be faithful means to keep coming back and doing the very best I can. There's an old saying he used to say around these rooms about, if you like everybody you meet in an AA meeting, you haven't been to enough meetings. <laughs> and that's true. There's a lot of people I meet in AA I can't stand, and I wouldn't want to have a cup of coffee with them well, you, but you know what? I've learned in these rooms that my job is to love those individuals. I have to learn how to love them. That's a challenge. To love people you don't like. To love people that don't look like you. To love people that think differently than you. To love people whose politics are different than you. To love people whose sexual orientation is different than yours to love people, who, whatever, but understanding that in that other individual, there is God. God is in every individual we meet. God is in me. And if I understand these steps at all, these steps are telling me that in order to do his will and to become empowered to do his will, I better well recognize the necessity of being a channel of love and peace. To anybody and everybody I meet. I uh, mentioned earlier about my uh, ancestors going to Canada, which reminds me of another one of my ancestors. Uh, my father was born in Mississippi. And uh, during the Depression, the 1930s, we lived in the North and uh, food was kind of scarce sometimes. And in the summertime, my father would send us to Mississippi to the farm because there was always plenty to eat on the farm. Also on this farm was Grandma Catherine. Grandma Catherine had been bo was born a slave. And she was a little, little lady. She was about this tall, black as a telephone, had a most radiant smile. And I used to love to sit at Grandma Catherine's feet. And she would tell me about how it was in the Civil War, how it was when the Union Army came through that part of Mississippi, and particularly how it was the day that they came through and told her that she was free. They came through and told her that she was free. And then she would tell that story she would just become radiant. And she'd begin to sing an old spiritual. And one verse of that spiritual was, just when I thought that all was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. You know what? These 12 suggested steps applied to your life and my life will make the chains fall off. We can be we can find, we can get out of that self-centered fear. We can get out of the bondage of self. Self is the problem. See, it's not alcohol. Self is the problem, right? You know, I'm the person that they wrote that thing about, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, I'm the one. I'm the one. Self is the problem. It's not alcohol. It's self. And so I need to break out of the bondage of self the prison of self, so that I can become free, free to become me, to be me. 
And I am offered in this program the tools to do that. And isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Thank you so much for letting me share with you.